said the champion of heaven made a way for all to enter in. You know what all means? It actually means all. That includes you, whoever you are. God is no respecter of persons. Doesn't matter what color your skin is. Doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. Doesn't matter what you wear. The champion of heaven made a way for all to enter in. Praise God. You know, the scripture says that if one man, Jesus, died for all, then all men died. And it says that we've been crucified with Christ. Now, when was he crucified? He was crucified over 2,000 years ago. So that means that I was crucified with him, in him, over 2,000 years ago. And if I was crucified with him over 2,000 years ago, I was raised to new life in him over 2,000 years ago. Do you know that he came as the last Adam? He took everything of Adam and crucified that man. And then he came as the second man, head of a new generation. And that's us. We're going to baptize our sister here today. She's entering. She's going to be identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But she was in him over 2,000 years ago. You were in him. You were crucified with him.
God didn't spare his own son. Yes. He gave us his, his very best. And he's not withholding good from us. He gave us Jesus. So as you walk, no matter what happens, go, you know what? I know that God loves me. I know he loves me. And I think your eyes will be open. <laughs> to see his goodness. All right? You know, in praise, this is my voice here. Praise changes your circumstances. Woo! So I'm going to invite you to praise the Lord with me today. Praise him. We're creatures created to praise the Lord.
we just do something? Can we just hold hands real quick? Let's just stand up and hold hands. I just feel like there's some people in here that just need to receive. Let's just stand in oneness. We're just going to agree that healing manifests. We've all got loved ones near and dear to our heart. They need a healing touch from the Holy Spirit. We just agree right now, Father. We just command all sickness to leave in the mighty name of Jesus. You cannot reside in those bodies. You must go in Jesus' name right now.
Welcome. Let's give God another hand. That was awesome. Man. Home of the Show of hands today if there's if if as a young man where I was going nowhere as fast as a person could get there. There was a time in my life where I couldn't lay my head down on the pillow unless my um, unless I was altered by some foreign substance and it was usually alcohol or pot and um, I met Debbie I guess in somewhere around 20 years old and, and I had dropped out of school and I was failing this and flunking that and losing this job and messing my body up every day and she came into my life and began to point out to me who I really was and and help me identify to myself that who I was not amen and she began to pour into me things about me that I had I couldn't even see but she spoke to my potential and it really just rocked my world um, and if somebody's done that to you praise God for that but even as much as that meant to me that doesn't even show up on the radar. That doesn't even come close to comparing to what Jesus did for all of us. You know, when he showed up on this earth some 2,000 years ago, he completely wrecked this entire system. He rocked everybody's world. He changed everything. And that sounds, as a Christian, that sounds so basic, but I can tell you for two-thirds of my Christian journey, I gave lip service to Jesus. I knew that there was a Jesus. I said in my mind that I accepted this Jesus, but I did, really didn't have him rocking my world the way he has now. And I just, as you worship with us today and as Jake brings a message, I just ask you to pay special attention to really what difference that Jesus has made in your life. He changed everything. He didn't just change a few things. He just didn't make a small difference. He made all the difference. You know, there's a politician out there on the scene right now, whether you like him, love him, hate him, whatever, he's kind of uh, changing the world of politics because of uh, him being an outsider. And that's the way Jesus was. Now, I'm not comparing Jesus to any politician, but he, he rocked this system of, of what we knew, the, the, of uh, sacrificing for the blood of bulls and goats and trying to obey a law. Jesus changed everything. So just as Jake comes and as we pray, maybe think about that person that made a difference in your life, but also think about what Jesus has done and how he has just completely rocked our world. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we just give you all the praise and honor and glory for who you are and Father, for sending your son, Father, as the perfect representation of you Lord, that we could see firsthand how much you loved us and the price you were willing to pay for us and that you could fulfill the law and give us a better system. You could rock this system. You could replace this current system with a, with a better system, a system of grace, love, and mercy. And Father, we give you the praise for that. We just uh, trust right now you're going to open hearts and minds and circumstances are going to be changed. Situations are going to be reversed. People are just going to find the, the true meaning of who they are in life, Father. We just praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on up, Jake. I just want to say something real quick about what Dave was saying. You know, I don't know you. I don't know you. 
but I know you're God. So you may think there's no potential in me, but see, I know that that's a lie because I know my God and he created you and he created you in his image after his likeness and he put greatness in you. Do you know that there's a king in every one of you? There's a king in you. There's good things in you. God created you on purpose for greatness. Every one of you, greatness. There's greatness in you. So as we come here and we get to know our God, we're going to draw that greatness out of you because it's in there. It's in there. It's in there. It's in there, Jameson. There's greatness in every one of you. There's greatness in you. You have potential because I know my God. He doesn't create junk. Amen? He created you on purpose. He has a plan for you. A plan for your life. To change the world. To influence the world. Right, Edward? You're doing it. He's changed you, hadn't he? There's a king in you, Edward. Amen? Praise God, every one of you. He doesn't make junk. Amen? Praise God. Here you go, buddy. My wife, Michelle, saw stuff in me that I did not see in myself. It's the only reason I'm standing here. On the surface, I was nothing but dross, and there was no gold. And uh, I only saw dross. She saw nothing but gold. And, uh, man, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. Maybe it's been a while since somebody's told you there's gold in you. There's gold in you, man, woman, child. You know, uh, we know how to identify a masterpiece, don't we? You know, we can look at, like, the Mona Lisa, and basically everyone agrees it's a masterpiece. When da Vinci painted it, he didn't get done and discard it. Why did he not discard it? Because he understood it was a masterpiece, right? The only reason we have the ability to recognize a masterpiece when we see it is because we're made in the image and likeness of God, and he knows how to recognize a masterpiece. He recognizes a masterpiece when he looks at you. You were fearfully and wonderfully made by his hands and maybe a world system or a religious system has come to steal that belief out of your heart but I'm telling you God still sees a masterpiece he still sees nothing but gold nothing but value amen you know if if I had a hundred dollar bill right now and it was covered in mud and vomit and I, and I tried to offer it to you, would you say, no, it's too dirty? <laughs> what are you concerned about, Jameson? You concerned about dirt or are you concerned about value? It's called, value. It is called the purity in which you receive your blessing in heaven. Amen, man. Make it right. Jesus has paid for the sin of the whole world. You know, not just special people. You know, he paid for the sin of the tax collector as much as he did, the guy who's been perfect and walking with Jesus his whole life. And that is supposed to put us on an equal playing field and allow us to view each other in love without judging each other. But we have this tendency to want to be God's special ones, just like the Jews did, to the point that Sometimes we can't receive Jesus and what he stands for because our sense of entitlement and pride to want to be the special ones is so strong. You know, if you read Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, Paul is appealing to his beloved Jews that Christ has made it so whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You would think this would be good news for the Jews if they loved people. But they were so concerned with being God's special people that that message made them angry. And Jesus became a stumbling block, a rock of offense. Amen? 
And that's the whole thing, part of the system that Jesus came to abolish. That system of hierarchy, that, you know, church is this ladder, and we're all trying to climb this ladder, and we're all, you know, uh, the preacher's up on the top rung, and, you know, the, the janitor's down on the bottom rung, and all of that is garbage. It is not what Jesus stands for. If we need titles for validation, we have not received validation from Christ. Our validation must come from the word that God has spoken to you revealed in Jesus Christ, which is you are so valuable and he's so pleased with you and welcomes you so much that he himself laid his life down to reconcile you, to try and beat it into our head how valuable we are, what a masterpiece we are. You know, the cross is not about man's sin. Did you know that? It's about man's value. I challenge you to receive that word. If we were not valuable, the cross never would have happened. Reconciliation never would have been pursued by God if we were not valuable. There may be some mud and vomit on the $100 bill, but God sees the value. You know, Matt and Michelle, I'm from Lexington. They went and ate at Merrick Inn. It's one of the nicest restaurants in Lexington the other night. You know, at the end of that meal, if the bill was $78 and you gave the server a puke, uh, vomit, and dirt-covered $100 bill, he will not reject the $100 bill. You can go shop at the Apple store and have a $65 bill for buying two chargers, which is a ripoff. Get them on eBay. <laughs> Can I get an amen? And hand that cashier a disgusting, puke and dirt covered $100 bill and he will still ring you up and accept the payment, will he not? Amen? The cross reveals man's value. I want you guys to turn really quick before we get into it to Romans chapter seven, verse seven. And I wanna read this passage. And uh, this is such a powerful passage. Is everybody with me so far? Do you believe you're valuable or not? God says you're valuable. And what God says is the only true reality. If you can root your emotions and your self-worth in what God says about you, you will not be moved when other people say things to the contrary. And his reality is the only reality. And he says, I see gold in you in you. You're so valuable. I laid myself down to reconcile you. So do you believe you're valued? Some of you, I feel it, you know, in the spirit. I mean, you're like, uh-uh. Yes, you are. And I just trust by the Holy Spirit that he's going to bring power to that word in your heart. And it's going to germinate and you're going to believe it. You know, uh, the Bible says the letter kills and the spirit gives life. The letter is a reference to the law system, do's and don'ts, to please God or not please God, to, to earn blessing or to earn a curse. The Bible says that system kills, but the spirit gives life. Amen? In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, this is Paul talking. I had not known sin, but by the law. That's a powerful statement. He only became aware of sin because there was a commandment present. Amen? Have you ever been somewhere and you've been doing something that you didn't know was against the rules? Sin wasn't present. You didn't know you were doing anything wrong because there was no command present. You know, I didn't know I was doing anything wrong when I had Metallica CDs as a teenager. Until a command came and said, those CDs are satanic, throw them in the trash. And then I felt so sinful for having Metallica CDs. I used to listen to Master P. Can you believe that? Who remembers Master P? <laughs> Without the command, yeah, make them say, na 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 na. That's what Jesus said to the law. <laughs> I 
I'm going to keep my ears open for your next, you know, I don't listen to Taylor Swift, but man, her songs are expertly crafted comments. <laughs> and I'm like, Michelle, does he listen to Taylor Swift? Let me check that iPhone playlist. <laughs> no disrespect, Taylor Swift. She's on my, what? I'm just kidding. <laughs> But I didn't know there was a commandment that said that's satanic or that's sinful or whatever. And I'm not telling you to go buy a Masterpiece CD or go buy a Metallica CD. But I'm just illustrating that until the commandment came, I didn't know there was sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the law makes you knowledgeable of sin. Is the law sin? God forbid. I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law said, thou shalt not lust or covet. You know, lust doesn't just mean sexual things. It just means a strong desire. You can lust for a guitar amplifier. You can lust for a car. But sin taking occasion, verse 8, how does sin take occasion? By the commandment. I encourage you to follow along in your phone apps or in your Bible because when you see these words, it's more powerful than me just saying them. But sin taking occasion by the commandment. How did that happen? Okay, so I had that Metallica CD and the commandment came and said, throw the Metallica CD away because it's satanic. And so I obeyed the command because I had a sincere heart to please God. I didn't want to do anything wrong. But you know what? I loved that Metallica CD. It spoke to me, man. Heavy metal has always spoken to me. I don't know why. And then I got my allowance. Had 20 bucks at the mall with my buddy. And there's the FYE store. Anybody for your entertainment? You know? Back when there used to be CD stores. And I looked at the M's in the rock slash metal section and there's Ride the Lightning, the Metallica album. And I remembered the commandment that said, thou shalt not listen to Metallica. And the more I thought about that commandment, the more ways I rationalized how I could buy that and hide it. I was paying cash, so I mean, nobody could look at my bank statement and see that I... I spent about $18 about the cost of a CD at a CD store and then asked me what CD did I buy. And I went and bought that CD. And the more I thought about that command, the more I wanted to break the command. And this is the same thing that Paul is teaching here in Romans chapter 7, 7 through 9. But sin taking occasion by a grace preacher? No. <laughs> Grace teaches you to deny sin. According to Titus 2, verse 12, I also encourage you to read that verse. That which actually teaches people to live holy has been demonized. We must realize this. The thing that we need to stop sinning has been demonized in churches. And so we preach law and commands thinking it's going to fix the sin problem. Dale, isn't it crazy? So we simultaneously preach that which strengthens people's desire to sin while commanding them to stop sinning. Don't you think that would make it hard for people? The law strengthens sin. The commandment comes and makes you want to sin. But we preach so much commands in church, so people want to sin. And then we're like, I'm so mad, stop sinning. But we're feeding it. So what does God want to do? What is he doing in the earth? You know, one of the best ways to kill something is to stop feeding it. To starve it out. If you want something to die and you don't have the guts to get a knife and kill it or something crazy, you starve it, don't you? You just stop giving it food. The food of sin is the law. So if we want sin and its hold on people to die, we stop feeding it by preaching law. 
Does that make sense? We starve it out. Grace is the kryptonite for sin. Your sin problem cannot handle a grace revelation. It can't. Grace in the original language means not just unmerited favor. Praise God. Your righteousness was unmerited. The favor that's on your life is not because you did well enough to earn it. It is unmerited. It's all because of Jesus and what he did. It's all because of him. Can we say thank you, Jesus? Praise God for the aspect of the definition of the Greek word charis translated grace, which is unmerited favor. Praise God, but it does not stop there. It says it's the divine influence upon the heart. So the law comes and influences you towards sin. Just like Paul is saying, you guys know I'm not crazy here, right? But grace comes and influences you away from sin. It changes your want to. It teaches you to deny ungodliness and live soberly, righteously, and present in this world. Well, Jake, it would be a lot easier if you just gave me a list of seven things that I could adhere to. That I can look at that list. It's tangible to me. This whole just being led by the Spirit thing is really mysterious. I don't know how that works. I need something that I can just look at and I can adhere to that. I want to tell you, as you walk in relationship with Jesus, he teaches you the seven steps without a sheet of paper. It just happens by relationship. You'll find moments of wisdom that the Holy Spirit shares, you, shares with you to guide you in your way and keep you safe. You'll also have years pass by and then realize, holy cow, that thing that clung to me has fallen off. And you didn't even notice. Because you were so busy walking with the Lord in the cool of the day, it just fell off and you didn't even notice. Your focus got off of it and onto him. Your fellowship was not with your sin and your guilty conscience. Your fellowship is with the Son. Amen? Grace is so powerful, man, and it's, and it's that which people need to stop sinning. Not law. Sin takes occasion by the commandment. You guys understand so far? So that which people need has been villainized and demonized. Stay away from the grace preachers. God says, listen to the grace preachers. I'm not saying listen to me. I'm saying Read your Bible and see these things with your own eyes and make your own decision and calculation so that it is yours and not just me saying it to you. So that it's authentic. You have made a mental calculation. The Bible says I reckon myself dead to sin. Do you know that Greek word translated reckon means to make a mathematical or scientific calculation? It means you sat down with a specific set of information and you made a calculation. So I wanna give you a specific set of information so you can make your own calculation and apply it to your life. Do you wanna be bound forever? No. Do you wanna get free and stay free? This set of information is this. Sin takes occasion by commandments. The law strengthens sin. You didn't even know sin was a thing until somebody came and told you it was a thing. Like the Metallica CD, I didn't know that I was sinning by having that until someone came and told me. You have those three facts in your set of information, and then you have the fact that Jesus, Moses came and gave us the law but Jesus came and gave us grace and truth. So grace and truth came through Jesus and truth, the Holy Spirit put that next to grace and not law. Is the law true, good, just, and holy? Yes. 
but Jesus is the truth. We know that grace is the divine influence upon the heart. Is God going to influence you towards sin? No. It's a divine influence. It's a godly influence. You know, uh, one thing that grace does is it will produce thankfulness in your heart. When you're living under commandments and your Christian life is totally based on commandments and following them and not following them, thankfulness struggles to reside in your heart because you're just frustrated. You got this heart to please God, you wanna defeat your struggle, but you can't because you can't live up to the commands because that command is strengthening your desire to sin and making you weaker and weaker in terms of defeating your struggle. And so you're frustrated. You're not thankful to Christ because you don't understand what he did. Grace comes and says the favor of God is on you not because you toiled and strived enough to earn it, but because Christ earned it for you, he did it for you and as you, he made himself one with you and he died your death and he was buried in your burial and then he rose with you. You rose with him. Amen? Those are true things in your Bible in Romans chapter 6. That happened. You begin to meditate on those things and you get thankful. And thankfulness will never lead you towards sin. This is one of the things, why, reasons why law is so cruel. You can't be thankful. You're just frustrated. So you begin to understand what Jesus did for you, that he fulfilled the law. The old covenant is gone. Unless you were a Jew, you were never under it. I say that all the time, but so many of us don't realize that. We lived our whole lives under a covenant that was never made between God and us. It was made between God and Israel. And so he came and he instated this new covenant in his blood of grace. His mercies are new every day. Amen? And you start to get thankful. And one thing that thankfulness leads to is loyalty. When I ponder upon how thankful I am for my wife, Michelle, it does not cause me to want to go cheat on her. Amen? How much sense would that make? I love my wife so much. She's so good to me. She loves me no matter what. She embraces me despite my many, many imperfections. I'm going to go betray her. What? That's, that's what we say about preaching grace. Is that if I hear that she loves me and her favors upon me in an unmerited way, I'm automatically going to go abuse that and just go start cheating on her everywhere. No, that's not what happened. When I understand that she loves me in, my, in, in its unmerited love, it doesn't waver when I do bad or good. It's just there, unchanging. When I think about that, I get thankful. And it makes me want to be the best man I can for her. It doesn't make me want to cheat on her. And it's the same way with God. When you begin to understand grace, you get thankful. And you want to be the best you can for him. Not because he told you to. Not because he said, you better or I'll fry you forever, consciously. You'll feel every second of it. I know that one resonates. It's not because he said that. It's because you understand how much he loves you. And you would never want to betray him. Just like my wife and I. Amen? So if we want sin to die, we must starve it. What is the food of sin? Law. Rules and regulations and commandments. So we stop feeding law, sin dies. Amen? And then grace comes alongside and teaches us to do what we never could while trying to live according to commandments, which is walk above sin, godly and upright and righteous in this present world, according to Titus chapter 2, verse 12. Amen? Does that make sense? I want to finish here. Um, this is huge, guys. 
Um, you know, and I know you guys think I say the word grace too much, and it's like, man, he hammers this grace thing nonstop. Grace, 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 grace. Golly, can you talk about something else? When I feel in my spirit that everybody's got a hold of it, I will talk about something else. I want to make sure everybody's got it before I move on. I have been the guy in class who did not get it yet, but the teacher still moved on and I got left behind because I was too ashamed to raise my hand and say, I'm the one person out of 30 that doesn't understand yet. You may have been that person. And so the teacher just, whoo, because their understanding is that everybody gets it. So let's go on to trapezoids now. We got triangles and circles or whatever it is. Let's go on to calculus. Thank you, Jesus. I've been delivered from calculus. <laughs> I'm just going to ask you guys, do you believe that the grace of God is the power that you need to defeat sin? It is. And if you don't agree with me, your, your problem is not with me, it's with the scripture. And I may be the messenger that's bringing you that thing and that may make you mad, but you're mad at the word. You're not mad at me. And so I have freedom in that. I know that. But God is covering the earth in a garment of grace. Guys that have been preaching law for 30 and 40 years are getting revelations. We had a guy here, uh, what was his name? He came with Melanie Keys, and I asked him to share his testimony. This guy was a denominational minister, uh, nothing against denominations, um, for 35 years, I believe, preaching the law, sling, slinging Moses. You know, spitting. I mean, he was telling me how he used to preach. And then one day, he had the TV on, and I think his personal story was he heard Joseph Prince. And he said, I was madder than a snake. He said, I was so mad. I was walking around in my living room. I was so mad at that guy for the heresy he was preaching. But he kept watching. And I'm not saying Joseph Prince is perfect, but he's an awesome grace teacher. Nobody's perfect. You guys understand that? I'm not perfect. I'm not the holy man and you're not holy. We, we all have the same Holy Spirit. I may be the guy that talks most Sundays, but I'm no more special than you. You're the apple of his eye. Amen? We've got to break free from that culture. And he began to study. You know, the Bible says that to this day, when Moses is read, the veil remains on their hearts. What does that mean? When we preach commands and rules and regulations, people can't see. Their eyes are blinded from the truth. In 2 Corinthians 4, I believe it is, is a prayer that I used to pray when I was on the phone lines in Colorado at a prayer center. And it says, uh, somebody can correct me on the passage, but it says, um, the, the God of this world has blinded the eye, people's eyes so that they cannot see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. And I used to think that was Satan. It's not talking about a horned devil going around putting blindfolds on people so they can't understand the gospel. If you look at that word in the Greek, it's aeon. The God of this aeon, that means age. Specifically, what was the God of the age of the Pharisees? What was their God? The law. Paul is saying the God of this world blinds people from seeing the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. He's not saying Satan, he's saying the law. The God of that age was the law. That word is translated world. So we think, woo. But you get into the original language and you see it's not talking about the cosmos, everything. It's talking about a specific age, a finite age that had a beginning, finite that had a beginning and an end. Paul is saying 
The law blinds people from seeing the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. This does not appear, this concept does not appear one time in the New Testament. It appears about 50 times, including from the very words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. When he said in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Holy Spirit is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, and to preach the recovery of sight to the blind. That word translated blind means mentally blind, mental blindness. He's saying, I'm here to preach the truth to legalists. Blind people that can't see what God's really like because their heart is veiled by the law. Why is it so important that we stop feeding people the law? Jesus' mission was to set us on the course of stopping feeding people the law. He's trying to set us on course and get us going in the right direction. In John chapter 1, verse 18, it says that no man had ever seen God, but the Son came and declared. The word him there, if you look in your Bible, is italicized. It's not in the original language. And I'm not trying to get too teachy. I just want to, I'm hammering home this concept, guys. The law, commands, and regulations heard from a pulpit or wherever, if that's how you relate to God, it will keep you blind. It's powerful and it's very serious. These, this is people's lives. If you don't love people, keep preaching law. If you actually do want to see people set free, and begin to have some love and joy and peace, you must stop preaching Moses and start preaching Jesus. Do we care about people or not? I'm getting fired up. <laughs> the reason that I was in the situation I was at 26 years old was because of the law. I th my misunderstanding of the law's purpose, okay, the law is good and just and holy, but I thought it was the standard by which I lived and related to God. I could never meet the standard, so I quit. The Bible says Christ is the beginning of wisdom. Well, I was not walking with Christ, so I was a fool. I had no wisdom. Because you need to be walking with Jesus to have wisdom flow through you. Wisdom starts with him. It doesn't start with Moses. It doesn't say Moses is the beginning of wisdom. Christ is the beginning of wisdom. And I got in Debbie's car and I heard this guy preaching Christ. And I'm telling you, it broke off the Moses glasses. And in three hours, I felt like, holy cow. I was so parched. I wanted to please God so bad. I was thirsty. I had cotton mouth. It was horrible. And I needed living water. And I finally got some and it tasted so good. It totally changed the direction of my life. And it was not the water of Moses. It was the water of Christ. Moses served his purpose, but we've moved on. Do you know that the purpose of grace is not to empower you to follow the law? This is a big one. Well, yeah, we're under grace. Praise God. He gave us that grace to empower us to follow the Ten Commandments. Amen. Following the Ten Commandments is, is a good thing. Don't kill people. Don't covet. Don't have gods before God. Amen. Hear my heart. But the law, the Ten Commandments, was a shadow. It was not the substance Okay, so Christ is the substance of the shadow of the law. The shadow pointed towards him, but it's not him. It's just his shadow. So think of your marriage. Does your oneness with your spouse empower you to love their shadow or to love them? You're married to Christ. You are his bride. When you're mindful of that, okay, just imagine my wife and I, Michelle, okay? We're married, amen? 
Imagine I just followed her shadow around and would try to hug her shadow, try to cling to her shadow for dear life. I would always go to well-lit places so that she had a shadow. I hated the nighttime because there was nothing to hug, <laughs> nothing to cling to. Would you not think I was crazy? I mean, you would be like, dude, the real thing is right there. Your warm-blooded, beautiful wife is right there, and you're rolling around trying to hug a shadow. <laughs> You'd be like, what an idiot. <laughs> Dale just came out and said it. I love that. We're running around hugging a shadow rather than the substance. Grace doesn't empower you to hug a shadow, to hug the shadow of the law. It empowers you to hug Jesus, the substance. The Bible doesn't say that the old covenant was the law of God. It says it was the law of Moses. Notice that? Have we ever thought about that? Everywhere you look, it's called the law of Moses, the law of Moses, the law of Moses, 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 the law of Moses. Whose law was it? Moses. But when we see that because of the way we've been raised, every time we read that phrase, law of Moses, we don't even realize what the Holy Spirit's trying to say. He's emphasizing something. That's the law of Moses. I'm making a distinction. Christ is the law of God. If you don't believe me, <laughs> in your Bible, Psalm 119 is entitled The Law of God. It has 22 sections, each section named after each of the 22 Hebrew letters, the Aleph to the Tav, the beginning to the end. Who's the beginning to the end? Jesus. In Greek, what would that be? Alpha to the Omega. What does he introduce himself to John on the Isle of Patmos in the book of Revelation? I am the Alpha and the Omega. In Hebrew, that would be the Aleph and the Tav. Ever notice how many chapters are in Revelation? 22. There are 22 Hebrew letters. Declaring that Jesus is the Aleph and the Tuf. He's the beginning to the end. He's the law of God. God doesn't come and take the Ten Commandments and write them on your heart. <laughs> Sorry. He writes Jesus on your heart. What does that mean? Son. He didn't write slave on your heart. He didn't write Mount Sinai on your heart. He wrote Mount Zion. Mount Sinai represents the law and Mount Zion represents grace. You guys looking at me like I have seven heads, like I'm the beast from Revelation. Come on now, is anybody with me? Yeah. Jesus is the law of God. We have the law of Moses. It was the shadow of the substance, which is Christ, who is the law of God. That word for law in Hebrews chapter 8 and in Jeremiah 31 is Torah. Sound familiar? That's what non-Messianic Jews live by. They reject the reality of the new covenant and Jesus. And they continue to live by the Torah. If you look at what the word Torah means, this is a mind blower. It means what is revealed by the man who hung on the cross. That's what Torah means in Hebrew if you break down the letters. Do you think that's an accident? No. It's a picture of the majesty of God and how detailed he is. He is speaking the word Jesus through every word of your Old Testament. The Old Testament is incredibly valuable. I read it all the time. But you have to understand its purpose is it is a shadow. The law and the prophets are shadows that point towards to the real thing. The real thing finally came and his name is Jesus. 
The last thing I want to just say here is back to John 1.18, where it says, No man has seen God, but the Son has come and declared, or and the Son has come and declared. So it's saying there, Jesus came and declared that no one had ever seen God. Okay, that's extremely radical. The Jews had had the law for a long time. Amen? We've got stories that God told people this, God told people that. You have to look at what that word really means. It was translated seen. And so you immediately in your mind, you hear that word. And whatever picture you get in your head is based on your understanding of the word seen, right? And so Jesus said, no man has seen God. So you think, okay, God's standing there and nobody's seen him. But the word means to discern clearly. Jesus said, no one has ever discerned God clearly. But you don't know that in your King James Bible, or your New King James. You have to look at the original language. I, I encourage you guys so much. There are online concordances that you can do for free. You can go to the library, at your house, whatever. It will change everything for you. Everything changes. Have you ever been misunderstood before and had someone acting a certain way towards you because they misunderstood? And then you brought clarity to them and their behavior changed. This is what happens when you read the Bible in the original languages. You're acting one way because of the understanding you have. And then the Holy Spirit comes and changes your understanding and you begin to act differently. Jesus said, no man ever has discerned my father clearly, ever. That's what I'm declaring. So he went to the Jews and he said, you ain't, you ain't seen him. You think you've seen him, you ain't seen him. This is what he declared throughout his ministry every day. You haven't seen him until me. At the very beginning in John chapter 1. It's laid out to us that Jesus is going to come and declare that nobody has seen God. But he's not just going to do that. He's then going to show everyone God. He's going to say, number one, you haven't seen God. You have not discerned him clearly ever to this point. You don't know that he's a father. You don't know that he is love. You don't know any of that. You've never discerned him clearly ever. But I'm going to show you. And if you've seen me, you've seen him. When you saw Jesus on the cross, you saw God. This comes against a lot of teaching. You saw the Father. Remember when Jesus said, I don't do anything that I haven't seen the Father do? That didn't stop on the cross. In Genesis chapter 22, in the story of Abraham and Isaac, God, and I'm almost done. Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide himself a sacrifice. He did not mean God's going to get something else and sacrifice it to appease him. He said, I'm going to give myself a sacrifice in a human body. I'm going to lay myself down because I'm not a God that needs sacrifice for my anger to be appeased. The whole point of the cross is for God to convince us he's not like the other gods that need a sacrifice. If you read in, in Hebrews, it says, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire. But we teach that God needed a sacrifice, woo! No, he wanted to be the sacrifice. This is his great love for you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay his life down for his friends. God was talking about, Jesus was talking about the Father. Woo, man, that gets me excited. Dave, I'm gonna bring you, I'll preach till 3 p.m. today, man. I'm fired up, I'm gonna stop. But I seriously, my heart is bursting out of my chest. I hope you all understood today. Grace is the answer for your struggle. 
it has been demonized in the church and we've been told to stay away from the very thing that will help us. Amen? So I just trust you to meditate and study these things out for yourself. It'll change your life. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. And, and if you're like me, and some of this still is a little foreign in terms of when Jake was always talking about the law and grace, because you've never categorized yourself as believing that way, just think of it this way. If, you've, if you're determining your Christianity by how well you follow the do's and don'ts, or how well you behave, you're probably somewhat under the law. If you determine your Christianity about how Jesus, what Jesus did and how he performed, then you're somewhat under grace. And if you're like me for three decades, you're a little bit of both. You'll walk through, okay, good, good and bad, do's and don'ts, rules and regulations, and Jesus, 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 and you kind of go back and forth to both. So uh, if, if you're in that walk, uh, praise God, you're getting hold of some grace. But just uh, we want to lead you into complete knowledge and through the spirit that grace is, is, the, is what Jesus came to deliver in the person of Jesus. Amen. We love you. We don't, we're not traditional here. We don't always have a traditional altar call, but if somebody's here that wants prayer, wants healing, wants uh, just somebody to, to, to love on with your current circumstances or situations, several of us are here after service. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to, uh, uh, to be a part of your life and to pour into your life through Jesus. Amen. Hey, we've got an awesome uh, food bank today. Today's one of the last two Sundays of the month. If you're here and you need food, uh, we've got 20 or so boxes back there made up and tons of produce. Now, I challenge you right now in the name of Jesus is learn how to do something with eggplant, <laughs> zucchini, squash. Those are three things we've got, but we've got a lot, we got a lot more than that. We've got awesome green peppers. Uh, we've got cucumbers, um, and we so before you leave, we've got the food bank, but we've also got something tonight. Jeanette is leading a group of our youth uh, to Silver Script. Silver Side. Silver Side. <laughs> Old Orchard Church, what time? At 7 o'clock tonight, there's a heavy metal band. We all heard that's Jake's heart, but there's a heavy metal band proclaiming Jesus at Old Orchard Church. Maybe you know somebody that wants to go there. Let's pray together before we're dismissed here today. Father, we just, we give you all the honor and praise and glory as the truth of your word is spoken. Father, we just ask the Holy Spirit confirm that in us, Lord, and, and teach us. And if we, we heard something we think that just can't be true, Father, I just pray the Holy Spirit just shows us in the word through, uh, through the spirit and not through a man what truth is, Father. We thank you for that. Thank you for the, the comforter. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who, who teaches us what's right and what's wrong and what's good and what's bad. We thank you for that, Jesus. We thank you for what you've done and the, the love that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we've got an offering box here on the, or a, a giving box on the side of a of the table as you're going out. So if you've been blessed and want to pour into our ministry, do so. Praise God.